Welcome to the conference, and I hope you enjoy it all and learn something. Every year I come from the last eight years, every year I go away and having learned something, and that's the single most important thing. So I'm now going to welcome Gert. <laughs> welcome. I'm going to talk... I'm going to talk <laughs> about decision-making under uncertainty in organizations. I invite you to a journey into our research at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin on decision-making in situations where there's no certainty. I will talk today about gut feelings, about defensive decision-making, and about heuristic decision-making. That's the art of ignoring most of the information and just focusing on the important parts. Uh, and we'll end with uh, ideas about less is more. That is, when you can do better if you are using less information. That's the program. Are you ready? Then we'll start. So the key distinction today is between situations of risk and uncertainty. A situation of risk is one where the future is like the past, where we know all states of the world that can happen, all their consequences and all their probabilities. If you visit this evening a casino and play the roulette, you are in a situation of risk. You can calculate how much you will lose, most likely, in the long run. This is, uh, and the, the casino itself, the managers of the casino, they similarly can calculate the gambling's art, they can diversify the risk across tables, and design countermeasures against cheating. There are not too many situations that resemble casinos and lotteries. But most of economic theories assume exactly that kind of certainty. In many situations, we are not in a world of certainty because some things are missing. We may not know whether the future is like the past, and we may not know all states of the world or their consequences and probabilities. This large world of uncertainty is common in business decisions, in investments, or in your personal life. If you're trying to find the ideal partner, you are in a world of uncertainty. Things, unexpected things can happen. Or other examples are Brexit. In hindsight, we always are smart, but we are talking about foresight here. The uh, Mervyn King, the former governor of the Bank of England, once said, if only banks would play in a casino, then we could calculate the odds and the risk weights, but they don't. They play in the real world of uncertainty Nevertheless, banking regulations like Basel 2 and 3 assume risk and certainty and believe that with highly complicated calculations one could produce safety under uncertainty. Now, even a casino is not just in a world of risk. Uh, Nassim Taleb that tells the story about uh, the management of a casino in Las Vegas. So they handled their risks, they diversified, they used probability theory, but the major losses occurred through unexpected events. For instance, in that casino, the worst loss occurred when the star artist performing his famous tiger act was attacked by the tiger. 
The second worst loss occurred when a dis disgruntled former contractor dynamited the casino. So as Benjamin Franklin once said, nothing is certain in this world except death and taxes. <laughs> what are the tools for dealing with uncertainty? Uh, probability and statistic theory go some way, but it cannot deliver the optimal solution in a situation of uncertainty, and actually, by definition, there is no way to find the optimal solution. In that situation of uncertainty, a key tool is an importance that's called heuristics. These are simple rules that are robust. And these heuristics often underlie human intuitions. And I will start with the concept of intuition, also called gut feeling. Let's define it. An intuition is based on years of experience with a certain topic. So it is a kind of feeling where you know what you should do or not to do, but you cannot explain it. So the reasons are in the unconscious. And nevertheless, it uh, steers much of our decision making, professionally or private. So intuition is not an arbitrary, uninformed decision. It is not a sixth sense, and it's not God's voice. And also, it's not something that only women have. We men also have intuitions. <laughs> but intuition has become a bad name in the last maybe 40, 50 years, in part through research in parts of psychology and behavioral economics who define themselves as showing that human intuition <coughs> fails relative to what's considered is rational choice. This research lives in a world of risk while we are talking about uncertainty. I have worked with large corporations and asked the managers <coughs> up into the executive board <coughs> sorry, how often a decision they make or the group in which they are makes is at the end a gut decision. And I emphasis on the end because course, one starts with looking through data and more data, but often the data doesn't tell you what you should do. And if in that situation an experienced manager has an informed feeling what one should do and what one should not do and acts on that, that's called a gut feeling or an intuitive decision. Yeah? So it's a form of unconscious intelligence. I give you one example of an international uh, technology provider and where the question was, how often do you rely on your gut feelings in decision making? So what do you think? What percentage of important decisions, such as whether one should go to Taipei or rather not, hmm, is at the end a gut decision? Zero percent, one percent, two, five, what do you think? Nine? Ninety. Ninety. Mm -hmm. I'll show you. What you see here is the hierarchy in that corporation from the managers to the heads of department to the group executives. There's nobody who says never intuitive decisions. There's nobody who says always intuitive decisions, and both is reasonable. On average, through the entire hierarchy, about 50% of all decisions are at the end a gut decision. The same managers would never admit this in public. One has 
fear. Fear of being blamed because for an intuitive decision, you have to take the responsibility. And we live in a society where fewer and fewer leaders are willing to take over responsibility. I have noticed two techniques that are not only in this company, but widespread, to deal with the anxiety of admitting uh, intuitive decisions and also of taking over responsibility. The first one is finding reasons after the fact. So, if there's a manager who believes that option A is the best for the company, but if he says that and it goes wrong, then he can't even explain it because it's, by definition, an intuitive decision. So, the manager may ask an employee to find, take, to find the reasons after the fact. And after a week or so, the manager will present the decision as a fact-based decision, not even mentioning the idea of intuition. This is a waste of time, money, and intelligence, only because one does not admit to a decision based on one's own experience. There is a more expensive version of this technique, which is to hire a consulting firm, <laughs> which then produces a 200-page document that justifies the gut decision already made and the PowerPoint along. This is even a, a, a larger waste huh, of intelligence, time, and money, because now in those uh, consulting firms, there are very smart young people, and you waste their talent for justifying already made decisions. Now, I've given in the last years a few talks to one of the largest, worldwide largest, consulting firm and uh, took the opportunity to ask the principal whether he would be willing to let me know how many of their client contacts consist of justifying already made decisions after the fact. He said to me, Gerd, I'll tell you if you don't mention my name. It's more than 50%. So this is the first technique to deal with gut decision or to hide them. The second one is more expensive to the companies. It's called defensive decision making. A defensive decision making is the following. Again, a manager, she thinks that option A is the best thing, but if it goes wrong, then she thinks, oh, so then I'm being blamed, so I better propose a second best option B where the likelihood that I'm being blamed if something goes wrong is not as high. That means defensive decision uh, occurs when a manager protects him or herself and hurts the own company. How often do you think this is happening in the large corporations that are on the stock market. And I'll give you the example of the same uh, large company here, where, uh, which is quite typical. So, how often do managers make defensive decisions hurting their own company? What do you think? Zero percent? One, two, five? The distribution is quite different now. It's much flatter. That means there are stronger individual differences. There are people who say never. And if you interview them, you get answers like, if the company is in good shape, I'm in good shape. 
If the company is not, I'm not. So here the identification between the leader and the company works. On the other end, you see a few who say basically always, I'm always choosing the second best option in order to protect myself. If you talk with them, then you get answers such, uh, in our company, you must not make an error, otherwise you're punished. Or, we have no error culture, we cannot talk about errors. Or, one said, my, you know, my motto is, cover your ass. <laughs> On average, about every third decision is defensive in this company. And this is according to the own managers and executives report. Of course, you can get this data only through anonymous interviews. And uh, <clears throat> again, one can make a calculation how much they are losing, not only in terms of fun, but also in terms of money by defending themselves. Defensive decision making is a larger ailment in our society, and it's increasing. If you visit your doctor and believe that your doctor advises you the best for yourself, then you are lucky. You have a good doctor. But many doctors practice defensive medicine. That means they protect themselves against you as a potential plaintiff or a troublemaker. That leads typically to too much of everything, too many antibiotics, too many surgery, too many uh, useless uh, screening procedures, and so on. The, again, the, uh, so the, the spread of defensive decision making depends on the climate of the corporation or here in healthcare on the litigation system. The US litigation system is most fruitful for defensive decision making. In one study, over 800 American doctors were asked whether they practiced defensive decision making. That is, they advised the patient something that would never advise their own mother, daughter, or husband. Uh, what proportion of these doctors do you think said, yes, that's what I'm doing? <laughs> It was 93%. And that's probably an underestimate because not everyone admits it and not everyone is willing to admit it to him or herself. The, uh, <clears throat> so we have here a chain that starts with mistrust against good intuition, defensive procedures like useless of hiring of consulting firms and defensive decision making and all of that slows down innovation. And here is the recipe how to do it. Always mistrust gut feelings. Demand an explanation for every new idea. And finally, promote a negative error culture in which errors must not occur and if one occurs one looks for the person who is guilty, and large amounts of documentation, and more documentation, and more documentation. Imagine that recipe on this culture would spread to football. What would happen? Now, a player would score a goal from an unbelievable angle, and now the referee would run to the player and say, you explain me how you did it. If you can't, it doesn't count. <laughs> so, in the second part of this talk, I want to turn to heuristics. And heuristics are one of the major tools for decision making under uncertainty. As I mentioned before, heuristics have become a bad name in behavioral economics and unjustified so. And I will sketch here a program how to take heuristics seriously and study how organizations actually make decisions using heuristics. And it also produces some interesting 
ideas and results like situations where less is more. We are asking three questions. First, what's in the adaptive toolbox of a manager or just a normal individual? So what are the heuristics being used? That's a descriptive question. The second one is one, a normative one. So can we specify the situations where a simple heuristic works and where it does not work? That's called the study of ecological rationality as opposed to logical rationality. Uh, much of economics and rational choice theory evaluates decision making only by logical consistency. Yeah. That's not what you're doing. We are looking directly whether it works. While logical arguments are usually made that if you're consistent then you uh, increase welfare. But you need to show that. And finally, so we use the results of the descriptive and the normative to uh, design uh, decision systems that are intuitively to understand. So a logistic regression or a, um, or a typically machine learning systems is hardly to understand. And it gets more and more clear that it doesn't help in every situation and also experts do not accept systems they don't understand don't understand either because it's a, a neural network or because it's a business secret. And so we try to use, to design transparent systems. So I'll give you now one example of a very simple heuristic, and it's in the class of one reason decision making. That is, you ignore everything except one reason. So here's a, a problem. Assume you have a large company and you are uh, targeting information to your customers. But not every of your customer in your customer base of hundred thousands will still buy. So how to tell, how to predict which customers are still active and which were not active? That's a difficult problem. And it's a problem under high uncertainty because all kinds of factors may have a role here. There are two visions in our society about that. One is, it's a complex problem. We need a complex tool. The other one is, that I try to uh, promote here, it's a problem under uncertainty. Therefore, we need to look for robust heuristics. And they are simple. So let's first go to the complex tool. So the answer of standard marketing theory is uh, the Pareto negative binomial distribution model or similar models. And how to build such a model? You make a number of assumptions, and here are some of the assumptions there. And the model has a number of free parameters where you can fit to the data and then make your predictions. I'm not going to do mathematics with you here. If you're impressed, that's fine. Yeah? But you should not be impressed from any model. You should put it to empirical test. Um, colleagues have uh, observed that experienced managers do not use these types of tools, but they rely on a simple heuristic. The heuristic is called the hiatus heuristic. If a customer hasn't purchased within nine months, out, otherwise in. This is a heuristic that goes for one good reason and ignores all the rest. Now, can such a heuristic do good predictions? According to what you read, if you open a book in behavioral economics, this commits a large number of fallacies. Yeah? It ignores everything, it ignores the correlations, it and so on, and it's usually attributed to our cognitive limitations. But don't be misled. Put it to empirical test, not to a priori argument. I'll show you a study that has been done by two professors of business who believed in the Pareto negative binomial distribution a model and wanted to find out and show the managers that it actually does better. So I'm using this by purpose because it's a study by those who had not believed 
in heuristics, but unlike many others, put it to test. How do you put it to test? You uh, need a formal model of the heuristic. That's very simple here. As opposed to notions like availability or representative, where nobody knows what exactly they mean. Hmm? But they're very useful to explain everything after the fact. Hmm? So you need a formal model of the heuristic. You need to test competitively. So in this case, Pareto negative binomial distribution against the heuristic. And then you also need not do data fitting, but predict the future. That's been done here, was, was the result. So in the airline, the Pareto negative binomial distribution model made 74 correct predictions about whether customers purchased in the future or not. If you just do that and say it's better than chains, that's not good methodology. You need to do it competitively. And then you see that the simple heuristic does slightly better. It gets 77. The same for the apparel business. Here the difference is even larger. And for the CD now, that's an online service, it's the same. You only save all the effort doing these calculations. What you see here is called a less is more effect. Less is more means that you have a set of information. And by taking only a subset, you can make better predictions. Again, the Pareto negative binomial distribution has all the information the simple heuristic has, and more. Nevertheless, it doesn't predict this well. And I will explain in a minute how this works. In, as a general intuition, the complex models have lots of free parameters, and they overfit the past. And under uncertainty, the past, the future is not like the past. Uh, we have uh, replicated this study with uh, several dozens of uh, problems. We have used machine learning tools like random forests as competitors, so the strongest ones. Still, one reason decision making is not beaten. And now you may ask yourself, can we understand when this happened? And the intuition is, if there is one reason, in this case recency, that is so strong that the contribution of the others are exponentially going down, yeah, then that reason yeah, just swamps everything else. And you don't even do these calculations. And also, it's a very intuitive method. Everyone can do it. If you have managers calculate random forests, good luck. So I explain now in a um, more intuitive rather than mathematical way, what's the secret behind less is more? So first, let's consider the standard explanation why people use heuristics. So that's what you still find in old textbooks. It's the accuracy effort trade-off. So basically, by using heuristics, you save effort, but you will pay a price, namely on accuracy. You just have seen it's not true. In, in the example of the hiatus heuristic, you have left less effort and higher accuracy at the same time. And the important point is to find out when this happened and when this does not happen. So the, uh, in, in standard terms, the logic behind the accuracy effort trade-off is that the total error in prediction you're making has a bias. The bias is the difference between the true state and your average prediction and some noise. And if you get rid of the bias, then you do best. That's the meaning of the so-called heuristics and biases program where heuristics are seen as biases and get rid of the bias you are right? This analysis is correct in a situation of risk where everything is known, but not under uncertainty. Under uncertainty, there's another factor that's called variance. And the total error is not only bias, but also bias plus variance. Variance is loosely uh, a term, it's like overfitting, if you're aware of that. I'll show you now using a picture. Uh, 
the idea. So on the, the dartboard on the left side has the bull's eye. Each of these crosses is a dart. The player has a systematic bias. She is throwing too much to the right and down. The difference between the average dart and the bull's eye is the bias. Clear? The player has at the same time a low variance, so they're all close together, the darts. On the right side, there's another player who has zero bias. On average, the darts are exactly in the bull's eye, but only on average, and has a large variance. So the darts are all over the place. That illustrates both the concept of bias and variance, and also that the problem is not just getting rid of the bias. The problem is to have a healthy balance between bias and variance. And in that case, a biased method is actually better than a non-biased one. And here are briefly a few ways how to design strategies that have a good chance to reduce variance and then cause less is more effects. The middle one you have seen, just go for one reason. The first one is replace your weights, say, in a regression by equal weights. And introduce bias, but hope that you can uh, get more out of reducing variance. And finally, lexicographic heuristics that are going down. And I will give a, an example in a minute. So this is the general principle why simplifications can actually lead to better performance. And that only happens in a world of uncertainty. And this is why the typical attempt to reduce uncertainty to a world of omniscient risk yeah, is failing because the key differences are here overlooked. The confusion between a world of uncertainty and one of risk is known as the Turkey illusion. Why Turkey illusion? Imagine you are a turkey. It is the first day of your life. A man approaches and you fear he will kill me, but he feeds you. On the second day of your life, the man is coming again. You fear he will kill me, but he feeds you. On the third day of your life, the same happens. According to Bayesian probability updating, which is meant to be the rational standard or any similar model, the probability that he will feed you and not kill you is increasing every day a little bit. On day 100, it is higher than ever before, but it's the day before Thanksgiving and you're dead meat. So the turkey missed a crucial piece of information. It was not in a world of calculable risk, but there was uncertainty. The turkey illusion is probably more often committed by people than turkeys. Remember the last financial crisis before 2007, the ratings of the rating agencies and the channel evaluations in the financial system were going up and up and up and up. There was one big rating agency which could only project that the real estate market is going up because they were calibrating on the last five or 10 years and was always going up like the turkey. And uh, I'll give you now an example, concrete example of the turkey illusion. So meaning where one creates an illusion of certainty in a situation where there is nothing like that. Every year, precisely at the end of every year, the large financial institutions make predictions about exchange rates worldwide for end of next year. For instance, the um, large uh, institutions make predictions in end of December 
about the uh, dollar euro exchange rate end of uh, next year's December. How good are these predictions? Since uh, they are bought by managers, by companies, they must be good. What's expensive is good. Or now, I wondered about that, but I have not been able to find a single study that's longer than one year. And with one year, you can prove everything. So I got the data about the predictions from uh, more than 20 uh, large financial institutions, actually the largest ones, uh, such as JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, UBS, uh, HSBC, Commerzbank, Deutsche Bank, and so on. And then analyzed their predictions compared to the real values. Here's the result. So on the y-axis of this picture, uh, there is the exchange rate. 1.00 means $1, one euro. Higher value means the euro is stronger, uh, lower value means the dollar is stronger. You see here the predictions of the large financial institutions. Every point is one institution. The circle is the average prediction. So in December 2000, the predictions were made that you see here. And the average prediction was around $1, one euro. But you also notice a considerable spread the variability. It's about 20 cents or more. What was the actual exchange rate? It was lower than all prediction except one. That was Citibank, now Citigroup. And I can tell you this was the last time in 10 years that Citigroup was lucky. Now imagine you are one of these high paid financial analysts and you were too high. You're now making the predictions for December 2002. Are you going up or are you going down? You're going down, yes, that's what they do. What does the actual exchange rate do? Goes up. <laughs> Note it's outside the entire spectrum of predictions. Now, it is end of December 2002, and the uh, analysts are making the prediction for December 2003. What do you think? Are they going up or down? Yeah, you know it, yeah? they're going up. What does the exchange rate do? Goes up, even further. The second time, outside of the entire range of predictions. Now, it's December 2003. Predictions have to be made for 2004. What would you do? Yes, you would go up. That's what they do. And you might think about becoming a forecaster of exchange rates. You seem to do well. Hmm? And what does the real value do? It's still outside of the entire spectrum. So now it's December 2004. Predictions are made for 2005. What do you think the analysts are doing? They're going up, yes. What does the exchange rate? goes down. But now we can uh, speculate how they are doing these predictions. So we do not know what their algorithms are because they are top secret, because they are so valuable. <laughs> but we can make an informed guess. You may have noted that the predictions always lack, uh, they are always one year too late. And whatever the algorithms are, they predict the increase or uh, decrease from last year will just go on. That's very much like the turkey illusion. Now, with this hypothesis in mind, we can actually now predict the analysts' predictions. Although the analysts are not able to predict the actual courses, we are able to predict the analysts' prediction. So now they are going down. Yes, that's what they do. The exchange rate goes up, but at least the first time in the range. Now, 
what do the analysts do? They go up, right? The exchange rate is again outside of the entire spectrum. Then the analysts go again up, the exchange rate going down, and that's the first hit and the last one. <laughs> so the, the uh, prediction going down and the exchange rate is once again outside of the spectrum, so they go up and it goes down. Why are these predictions made every year? And they will be made this year and next year. So, and also why do companies and organizations pay to know about these predictions earlier than others? There are two reasons. One is that the managers do not know how bad these predictions are. And there is a good cause for this reason because the banks have no interest to publish this, not even to analyze these things. And that's maybe the first one you've seen. But there is a more interesting reason for that. Namely, the managers probably have a feeling that there's not much in these predictions, but they want to buy them anyhow. Why? Because of defensive decision making. So if you would be the CEO of a large company or whoever is responsible for, for these predictions and make the prediction yourself and it goes wrong, you feel responsible. But if you hire uh, one of these financial firms hmm, which makes useless predictions, that's fine. Hmm, because it's not your responsibility. Again, with the same waste hmm, of intelligence, of time and money for psychological reasons. And by the way, many applications of big data, I know, and preventive, uh, predictive alg uh, algorithmic predictions is, uh, are geared by motives that had little to do with the actual predictions, but this kind of psychological reasons. The last part of the talk is about intuitive design. So the question is, how can we use the knowledge about how people make decisions and organizations make decisions under uncertainty? And when these heuristics work, uh, how can we create decision systems that are transparent in the sense that a decision maker, such a doctor or a, a manager, can understand the algorithm and also memorize it. And I'll show you a family of heuristics that are called fast and frugal trees. So these are decision trees which are incomplete, where a structure is built in to reduce uh, the error through variance at the expense of some error through bias. A fast and frugal tree, you see here one. Hmm? And I explain the structure first. It's an incomplete tree that has a structure built in where after every question, an exit is possible. So it has uh, here the number of questions or predictors is three. So it has three plus one, four exits. That's the general definition of a fast and frugal tree. And unlike a full tree, which has many, many more exits. Um, the situation is a common one in uh, medicine. A man is rushed with severe chest pains into a hospital and the doctors have to make a decision about life and death. Should the man be sent into the coronary care unit or in a regular bed with telemetry? So basically the prediction is, does the man have or get a heart attack or a similar disease or not? In a hospital in Michigan, the doctors used defensive medicine and sent almost everyone into the coronary care unit to protect themselves. That overcrowded the unit, decreased quality, and increased costs. Then they called in a team from the University of Michigan, the medical team, to find a remedy, and they were first thinking about the usual complex problems, need complex solution, and had a, a logistic regression system that 
uh, was implemented in this way. Every doctor had a, a calculator and a chart with some 50 probabilities and was looking at the patient and put in the numbers and then pushing enter and then a probability occurred and if the probability was higher than the threshold, then coronary care unit otherwise, yeah. That's the usual type of uh, classic decision making. The doctors, of course, are likely to throw all of this away the moment the researchers are out because they don't understand it. And finally, the PI learned about our research at the Max Planck Institute and designed a heuristic for that. And that's a fast and frugal tree. Uh, and it just asks three questions, whether there's an est a change in ST segment, then, and uh, that's in the electrocardiogram, then immediately into coronary care unit. No other questions asked. Otherwise, are the key complaints chest pain? If not, regular bed. And otherwise, the third question that de decides everything. Then they tested that, and uh, the uh, tree outperformed the logistic regression and, of course, the defensive decision making of the doctors. Huh? So this is an example of an intuitive system. So that's way how doctors and most of us uh, think. You consider one important thing. If it doesn't work, you go to the next one. You go sequentially. Very few people, if any, uh, would weigh and add as the usual uh, models are like in a regression. So uh, a second example, this is uh, in our work with the Bank of England and where we are researching simple heuristics for a safer world of finance. I'll be brief, if you're interested, read. Huh? Uh, maybe start with Andy Haldane's talk. Andy is the chief economist of the Bank of England called um, The Dog and the Frisbee. That's uh, the, another heuristic I've not talked about. Uh, so it's how dogs catch balls, huh? or base uh, ball or cricket outfielders uh, catch a fly ball. Yeah? And they do not calculate, huh? consciously or unconsciously, the trajectory. They have a very simple heuristic. Just fix the ball, start running, and adjust your running speed so that the angle always remains constant. So. Uh, he was giving the talk at the uh, Jackson Hole meeting uh, of the central bankers, and it was a very unusual uh, talk and a very unusual title, and uh, it won him the prize for the best talk uh, of the year. And uh, the key problem here is, so one of the many problems of the uh, financial um, uh, crisis is shown here by the economist picture, it's modern economic theory that's geared for situations of risk, not for uncertainty. So for instance, according to Basel III, the regulatory framework, if you own a large bank, you have to calculate your value at risk, which decides how much capital you should hold to, say, survive 990 times out of 1,000. But in order to calculate that risk, you have to estimate thousands of risk parameters and they are dependent, so a correlation matrix in the order of millions, good luck. That borders on astrology. And uh, what we try to design and systematically study is make it simple. Simple heuristics that can bring more safety because they're not overfitting. And of course, uh, also, the, uh, they can, uh, the regulatory banks, so the central banks, uh, they can see easier when gaming is there. And there will be always gaming there. Here's an example of a fast and frugal tree who is now a slightly different structure. I'm not going into details what that is. It just asks three questions again. And a remark on the um, on the structure of the tree, this is now more extreme, and the, the design of the exit, uh, that determines the ratio between false alarms and misses. So for instance, the Swiss bank UBS, which required substantial support by the Swiss authorities during the crisis, had a leverage ratio of 1.7 at the end of 2006. 
So that would have just flown through in, in the first variable. That would be the end. So all these are attempts to set up a theory about decision making under uncertainty that complements the existing theories in economics in other fields which are geared towards situation of risk. So that means taking uncertainty seriously rather than trying to reduce everything to risk hmm? and also taking heuristics seriously. And I'll end here with three misconceptions that you find in almost every textbook in behavioral economics, in uh, uh, psychology, many other fields. The first one is heuristics are second best, complex models are always better. Wrong. That only holds in the situation of risk, where everything is certain. Second, complex problems would need always complex solutions. Wrong. You've seen examples. And more information, more time and computation is always better. Equally wrong. So here is a kind of summary of four uh, principles of this talk. Risk is not the same as uncertainty, and there are many shades in between. That means the best decision under risk is likely not the best one under uncertainty. And for instance, if you would have the example I gave of the Pareto negative binomial distribution model, if you would fit it to the data, it would win. That's a situation where you know the data already, but in prediction, it did not. Error cultures are extremely important for organizations, and we are, in many countries, on the way to get more and more defensive, to develop more and more documentations, and to protect ourselves instead of trying to do the best. And that will throw us back because we cannot deliver when we constantly try to protect ourselves and it will hamper innovation. Then I talked about intuitive design, the idea that we can design decision systems that are quite different from the usual ones, logistic regressions or uh, yeah, machine learning tools of the uh, various kinds and that help in situations where humans are involved, who want to understand what they're doing, or who have to make decisions quickly and uh, can remember such a system and to implement it as an, in an emergency department. And finally, more information, more time, and more computation is not always better. Less can be more. Thank you for your attention.